This is the sound of a $1,000 microphone. It's smooth, it's clear, but it's not super crisp or doesn't have a whole lot of presence. It's not super boomy. And that's a good thing. In fact, when I compare this microphone to the $250 version of it that I typically recommend as a budget microphone, three rings for the Elven Kings under the sky, seven for the Dwarf Lords in their halls of stone, nine for the mortal men doomed to die, one for the Dark Lord on his dark throne in the land of Mordor where the shadows lie. Three rings for the Elven Kings under the sky, seven for the Dwarf Lords in their halls of stone, nine for the mortal men doomed to die, one for the Dark Lord on his dark throne in the land of Mordor where the shadows lie. You'd be forgiven for thinking the out-of-the-box settings actually sound a little bit better on that cheaper microphone because it's already tuned to sound great out of the box whereas this microphone is meant to give you a little bit of analog flavoring, a little bit of that intangible tube amplifier sound but still be smooth and kind of raw so to speak to play with and, and, and mold and craft to your heart's content. This is the Lewitt Pure Tube, and it is a tube condenser microphone. It connects to this dedicated power supply with a dual XLR connector, and then runs to my normal audio recorder or audio interface or whatever. Lewitt has one of those we'll talk about in a moment. And it produces this just rich, natural sound that's also incredibly detailed and revealing of every little mouth sound and whatever, if you want it to be. And it's pretty crazy. Again, for background sound rejection, it's actually doing a good job. I've got two noisy computers, including a noisy server, right off screen here. I can make some noises around here. It still does a great job, despite being a condenser. But it's all about that pure analog vocal sound. And if you're looking to build a studio setup with a voiceover booth or have some dedicated, you know, voiceover tracks, this is the kind of microphone you'd go with. Now, this is the knocked down version, one fourth of the price ish of the LCT 1040 I covered the last year, which was an incredible microphone. And we'll go on and compare it here. Three rings for the Elven Kings under the sky, seven for the Dwarf Lords in their halls of stone, nine for the mortal men doomed to die, one for the Dark Lord on his dark throne in the land of Mordor where the shadows lie. Three rings for the Elven Kings under the sky, seven for the Dwarf Lords in their halls of stone, nine for the mortal men doomed to die, one for the Dark Lord on his dark throne in the land of Mordor where the shadows lie. The difference being, as far as I can tell, this is probably just the straight tube setting from that microphone, but that microphone has multiple different tube settings as well as the FET condenser built in. So you have so many different options for how you flavor your sound and capturing both the standard FET sound and the tube sound at the same time, which is a completely different tier of production or vocal booth settings that you might want. So this is kind of the knocked down version. The only close to $1,000 microphone I have to compare is my Sennheiser MKH416 shotgun mic that I typically use at this setup. Now the angle's a little bit awkward with the distances, but it's a completely different microphone. It is still used in some voiceover booths as Mike Delgadio often shows, but it is a shotgun microphone rather than, you know, a dedicated condenser mic right in your face. Because I don't have a Neumann or any other real microphone to compare it to that isn't from Lewitt, I went ahead and sent the A-B test of the LCT440 Pure, the $250 microphone, versus this microphone to a few of my friends who I trust their, their ears for, for audio judging, and this is what they had to say about the difference, which more or less matches what I think. I think if you're looking for you know, a cheap, easy condenser microphone where you can plug it in, get a great sound out of it, and maybe just tweak it a little, the LCT 440 is going to be what you want. I mean, and, and if you're looking at a microphone with the budget of $250, you're probably not looking at a $1,000 microphone anyway. But that difference comes in what you want to do with that sound. With something like this, I'm capturing it in 32-bit float so that we have complete, you know, audio headroom. I just hit the cord. <laughs> complete audio headroom with regards to processing, with regards to crafting the sound and everything. Whereas that cheaper microphone is built up and tuned to sound a specific way with a little bit of a presence boost and a little bit of, uh, of uh, lower end boost because it has a little bit more boominess with the proximity effect. Whereas if I get on this, it has, it, it, it smooths it. I like to describe it as like with camera turns of terms of rolling off the highlights. It kind of does that with the, the bass response on the tube microphone. And that's kind of the joys of the analog tube mics is newer, modern, more modern mics have just like, 
effectively more contrast, like like with images. I'm gonna keep making that analogy. Like they have the contrast and the saturation, you know, a little bit more punchy and whatever. Whereas analog, really tuned, you know, tube mics like this with really nice smooth sound have everything kind of rolled off. The 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 higher end detail isn't as clear or crisp. It doesn't have that really sharp crispness yet, but you can work with that in post. It doesn't have the super boomy bass, if that's what you want. It does have a warm, rich sound to it, but it's not super boomy. So then you can work with that and tweak it as you want in post as well. Whereas a microphone that's already tuned to be kind of punchy and in your face is a lot harder to tame those frequencies and to bring it back without just making the microphone sound weird, which is something I run into with every microphone I cover because I have a naturally kind of lower register, boomier voice and a little bit of a nasally one. Microphones that kind of emphasize that out of the box end up sounding a little funky as I try to tame those frequencies whereas a mic like this I can just craft a sound exactly as I want. Lewitt also released what might be my favorite audio interface that has released in a very long time. Now this has released quite a while ago. I'm very behind on these reviews. I've covered why that is with regards to my audio reviews before. But I wanted to go ahead and get these videos out to you because these things are still awesome. This is the Lewitt Connect 6. It's a USB audio interface but this takes everything like the Go XLR, for the most part, or the, the Elgato Wave XLR interface is kind of brought to the table with regards to multi-track USB audio devices, cleaner preamps, onboard DSP, which the Wavelink doesn't have, it only has VSTs, and so on, and cranks it to 11. So this doesn't have the onboard faders or the voice changer or anything that the Go XLR has. But what it has is very high quality preamps and you get two of them. That was a big complaint with things like the Wave XLR and the Go XLR is you only get one input two XLR or quarter inch inputs that you can map and control processing, gain everything independently. You've got one fourth inch jacks for your speaker outputs, which I've been begging for on more of these streamer oriented gear for a long time, as well as a 3.5 millimeter jack, which you could use for speakers, for extra outputs to route to other computers if you want, whatever. You have those dedicated outputs independent from two completely separate headphone outputs that you can manage separately too. You've got a 1 4 inch on number two and a 3.5 mil on number one, and you can use those independently as well. Then you have another 3.5 mil jack along with two more USB-C ports, three more technically. One is for your computer, and if you're just running a single computer setup, that one plug is all you need. The other one is for mobile devices, it supports iOS, Android if you get it working, and so on, or a second PC, and then you have a dedicated power plug if you're running it just to mobile devices or something where you need a little bit more power than perhaps you're getting over the bus. And then you have a 3.5 millimeter aux input. And the beauty of all of this is in the routing that is controlled both physically on the device as well as in the software. The software, it's called Lewitt Control Center, is very reminiscent UI-wise or like UX-wise to uh, PreSonus's universal control suite. It just, something about it just very much resembles that in terms of layout for me. But you get on Windows, you get three output tracks over USB that you can route audio to with Windows Sound Manager and so on. You've got, you've got one and two, three and four, and five and six. On Mac, you only seem to get a stereo output over standard audio device. Like you, you, controlling audio outputs on Mac is a little different, although over ACO it should be fine. But on Windows, you get those three separate devices that you can route your music to, your game sound separately from, your voice chat separately from. So when you're streaming, you can mix all of that a little bit better in your stream, either in the software or by adding the devices to OBS, which is really cool. So you got those three virtual devices that you can route your sound from your existing computer to, to mix and manage. You have an entire separate stereo input that you can get from a second PC which is freaking rad. I have been begging for dual USB host interface for a long time, and they only started showing up this year. That is incredible. Or a mobile device if you want to do like music or calls or something. I, I think the real game here is second PC. That shows up as a separate input that you can do what you want and mix and set stuff separately, as well as the stereo 3.5 mil aux input is its own separate input that does not interfere with the USB that you can mix and manage separately. And then you get two sub mixes output. I always prefer three for a variety of different reasons that we'll get into later, but you do get to manage your headphone outputs a little bit more independently. So just having to is totally fine, but you do get an A mix and a B mix, which you can control the levels for independently, and you can control the levels of each individual source as they go to that A or B mix independently as well, which is freaking awesome. You also have this giant knob, which spins very nicely on the front here and clicks in and clicking in allows you to adjust the input levels for one and two, your headphone volume levels for, a, for output one and two, 
your overall mix levels for A and B too. So you have six controls that you can do on the front here without any faders. These are so many features packed in this powerhouse of an audio interface. This thing is the most thoughtful interface I have ever seen without being a mixer. Now there are other devices like the Rodecaster Duo that I'm gonna be taking a look at soon. That is a mixer. It is more designed for mixing. It has more physical and digital IO and it has faders and everything like that. This has mixing functionality, but it's still designed to be an isolated audio interface. And they, they are different categories of products. If you want something that has more flexibility and more features and whatever, but you'll need a mixer, which takes up more space. Whereas this is an interface that's mostly supposed to stay small and out of your way. I realize there's a lot of crossover between the products, so it gets a little confusing to segment them. But this thing rules, and I am super stoked that we are getting more devices like this. As I mentioned, there are a lot more that have come out this year with these kinds of features that I'm stoked to continue taking a look at. One major issue that I did run into was with Discord. The Connect 6 does not seem to work with Discord on Mac. You see, I have it selected here, and every time I tried to use it for my D&D &D nights and things like that, I had to switch audio interfaces, and I, I assumed I just did something wrong when I was recording it, but this is just always true. If I turn down input sensitivity so that it is always active and we start talking, hello, hello, oh. it just completely <laughs> cuts out. I bet, oh, yeah, well, I, this is the weirdest thing I have ever heard. I bet, yeah, yeah. And this has been... This has been multiple reboots and whatever, and it still sounds like this. But I'm over the moon with this gear. Like, audio gear is getting so good now, there is no excuse to not have good audio in your content. Now, whether you should be buying a $1,000 microphone or not, I'll leave it to the audio comparisons for you to judge. But, but, whew, there's a lot of good options these days, and you're going to be hearing a lot of voiceover on this bad boy. If you're still not sure what to buy, keep in mind that what you buy doesn't always matter. Your technique and the content you're producing matters most. The gear is always secondary. Go check out this video if you want to learn more about mic technique and how to optimize that. And go check out my new shop where you can get my OBS tutorial course and other assets that I've been releasing over at glitch.mov. And remember to be kind, rewind.